pictures, then what we are actually talking about there is that there's an integrated learning. When I say integrated learning, it means seriously every single word of it. Talk about sports, talk about arts, talk about everything. Don't treat them as extracurricular. Please get that word out of your dictionary right now. It's not extracurricular, it is curricular. Because we are treating all these arts and sports and everything as extracurricular, we are not doing that extra. We don't want to do that extra. And most of us are happy being ordinary. You want to be extraordinary, then please remove that extra out of curricular, include all of this into your learning spaces. Instead of having wonderful facilities and just showing it to people, I would suggest we need to tell people that please use it. Whatever you have, please use it. One period a day for sports, fantastic idea. And I want to ask you directly today, how many of you are willing to go and make the change? One period of sports every day for every child. Don't tell me, it's not possible. I know, timetable wise, it doesn't allow you to use the ground. Okay, how many of you are doing? Please raise your hand. Wonderful. Please, please, ma'am. No. That's, that's exactly where I'm coming to. No, there are people who call it extracurricular. That's where I'm saying... Right. Even when you say co-curricular, let, let's... I. I preferably don't want yeah it's coexistent that's what we are talking about and that's where I wanted to move it to because I have interacted with quite a different set of schools okay I'm sure only one part of them were raising their hand that they were using one period a day for ma for for sports but similarly if I say one period a day a child could do art I'm, I'm sure we are talking about multiple intelligence and if you really want to implement MI in your school my question is is your teacher ready for it? We are all educationists, we all the leaders in the school. I'm sure we all sit at the topmost positions and make decisions, but implementation? We all have that problem, right? We all talk about, oh yeah, there's an issue, there's an issue in implementation. And we are here to discuss and probably debate and get something out of that. And I'm here honestly uh, for this particular conference to sit and understand at the leadership level, what are the plans that we are trying to do to get it to the grassroots level where the implementation actually matters? Okay, can we go to the next slide? Because that's something that I want to leave you with. What should it deliver? I'm trying to summarize most of what we have done with four things, the central one, which is uh, the five C. Of course, I think too much of color, but don't worry about it. The five C is that I think we all talk about it, but please try and understand, are we really delivering those things? One is curiosity. Okay, is, is curiosity part and parcel of learning of a child in our school? We all talk about it. Definitely we say that, you know, we need to work on curiosity and all that. First, that. Second thing is, what is our approach to provide clarity for the child? Are we allowing the child to do something on their own or are we still in the instructional mode to tell them, okay, you need to learn this. F is equal to MA, done with it. That's period for you. What are we doing on the communication skills of the child? How is the child learn, connecting his learning to day-to-day -to -day life? That's the four C's. If we can work on those four C, curiosity, clarity, connectivity and communication, the fifth C is automatic competence and that competence we are talking about from early childhood all the way up to your undergrad levels no no doubt about this this 5c is is actually the pillar that runs entire learning system now in our learning spaces our schools or any other space that we have built for the children what's the mindset that we are trying to build for these children are we working on the mindset and how are we working on the mindset are we working on their skills? What is our approach to work on the skill? How is my space relevant to develop the appropriate skill in the child? You could replace the space with your school. 
please ask these questions. These are the things that I'm looking at. That's where it's important. Importance of innovative spaces addresses these four things. The mindset, the skill set. The third one is naturally built in, which you're already doing, which is a knowledge set. You have a syllabus, you have a board, you are, you're following certain things. They're cramming up the knowledge or the information, I would say. And then the tool. This is something that we miss, which is what are the appropriate tools my child needs to know? Why am I so hell-bent on this is because I started my teaching career from masters. While I was doing my PhD, I got an opportunity to go back to my university and teach the masters. Simple. They didn't have their basics clear. So what did I do? I said, okay, let me start working on the bachelors. So I came back to the college where I did my BSc. I started teaching them. They didn't have the basic PU knowledge that was necessary. Information wise, they all knew Newton's laws. They all knew everything in physics, but application wise, most of the students were duds. That's, that's when I realized that they were not inspired to do science. They were just there because they didn't have anywhere else to go. And after 12 years of being in the school education, if that's the state of children that they don't know where to go, I am really doubting what is the education that we are giving our children today. And that's the reason why I had to start BrainStars with my friends and then we got into the serious issue of talking to educationists and understanding how can we work together. That's where I'm so fond of Newton, first law. I want to be that external unbalanced force so that we could see the change. And with educationists with a proper mindset, definitely we'll be able to bring about those changes. And the space that we are talking about, our school, if it can address these four, definitely it will do a lot to the children. We can reduce the number of suicides at 10th and 12th grade. And number of people still loitering around in the midair in the virtual space trying to figure out what's the right career for me. All these confusions are there because at the 1 to 10 level, somewhere we are missing the proper guidance to the children. Please don't take this personally, but definitely in our education system, we are missing that. We are not giving the children the right courage to go and face life. And if we need to do it, then my school has to be an innovative space. Has to be a space where the child finds comfortable in learning what they want to learn for their lives. Right? The last part. Excuse me, we're racing yeah, against I'm time. Done. And yes. I'm done. That's the last slide. Thanks. The same MSKT, I would just like to push it to what we can do in our innovative spaces, which has to touch everyone, because I'm sure all of you will understand that. The space typically talks about methodology and the kit. Kit, I'm using it in a very loose term here, which means that something that the child can take and do things. It could be a technology, it could be a hands-on equipment, it could be a simple gadget that they're learning. Everything the child's environment provides him when they're learning in school, okay? And then, of course, tech today, we already have uh, enough technology partners who are trying to give you uh, the sense of where you can take your child through and the easiest way to get them into assessment and find out whether the learning has really happened or not. So typically, what we believe in the MSKT technology at Nambanagar or BrainStars is that you know, if our space can give the right kind of methodology, being open enough to adopt quite a lot of things. I'm not saying that we should have a streamline, though my question initially was, can we streamline the primary education? That was only to understand, do you guys think of streamlining it or keeping it separate? And I'm happy that you want to keep it separate. Very impressed on that. Similarly, any space can be exclusive or could be integrated. You could have individual spaces like what you have for math, science, computer science laboratories, or you could have an integrated space, or your whole school could be a laboratory by itself for learning. So please think about it. That's what I want to uh, leave you guys with. Last slide and done with it. Thanks. Thank you. If there are any questions, please shoot one or maybe Thank one or two. And after that, post lunch, I think we can have. I talk a lot, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. That was a very, very thought-provoking and challenging uh, speech as far as.
i think you know probably challenging the leadership in the educators okay. i think we all have to think about that wonderful speech and any questions open can i request uh, mr rohan agarwal chairman of red bridge international academy to uh, felicitate uh, mr shri raghavan sm and i think we question. enjoyed your speech yeah. thank you there's a question we'll just take it yeah am i audible yeah yeah okay sure no i perhaps would not have asked this question because i think i was afraid of uh, being called a cynic yeah. no but problems. you you provoked me yeah please no we excuse have excuse me uh, to... uh, if uh, we are uh, we are racing against time i'm sorry to cut you short i'm the moderator for this conference sure. okay. we'll I'll definitely have your question after lunch and okay. probably over the lunch Sure, and definitely. Yes, uh, because we have. But if you could just speakers. pose the question, I'm not going to answer. I okay. just want to take okay. the question so that I, it I might be the question that everybody wants. I'll to place the question. You can answer Please. later. Please. Okay. Yeah. Now we have in our country something like uh, 300 million illiterate uh, in our country. No, I'm referring to illiterate parents. True. Perhaps this figure is much larger than 300 because illiter literacy is uh, just being able to sign your uh, sign na name. True. Now we are looking at the children of these illiterate parents. Now, how do we kind of handle this mass? of population the base of the pyramid as it were and how do these concepts kind of uh, sit on that in terms of uh, you know uh, making a difference to those uh, lives i i i refer to the statement that you made uh, right in the beginning that you know from pandit nehru's times we are talking about the same subject over and over again yeah. uh, this issue of illiteracy and uh, handling the parents True. Uh, i mean the who are illiterate because even in the earliest slide which i saw from uh, mrs uh, popatwa's uh, presentation uh, even the preschool to a primary the parent plays as much an important role as the teacher uh, yes, the sir. child was walking on a tight rope as if it was that was the so great. Uh, visual so given if i could just summarize in yes. the best interest of time yes. how uh, do we do this yeah who is going to bell the cat is that what you are asking how are no, we how going to address this how do we i mean belling the Fantastic. cat is obviously the education is job i mean yeah. the teacher's job because the parents are not able to help here Definitely. that is very clearly understood but sure, how sir. do we do this where the parent is completely missing from the equation yeah i think we'll not stand between the lunch so we will have a personal conversation there and i can uh, give you an ideas of what i am actually thinking how this can work sure thanks thanks a lot thank you so thank much thank you all and uh, look forward to talking to most of you thanks Thank you, Mr. Rohan Agrawal. Uh, we have another uh, panel discussion: how to make classroom teaching interesting. Again, followed by a similar topic, which is going to be very interesting. The chairperson for this uh, panel discussion would be uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Ms. Revathi Srinivasan. We request her to come on the stage. uh she she is a person with 23 years of experience in education and ms shrinivasan the director and principal of shrimati sulochana devi singhania school is a passionate educationist with a zest for learning and a person with an unbounded passion for mankind we are honored to have you on stage ma'am uh the panelists uh the first panelist has extensive experience for the last 23 years in the field of education she began her career in teaching and has held many leadership positions in leading cbsc schools i would like to welcome ms seema saina on the stage with 29 years of experience in the field of education the next panelist specializes in educational administration setting up schools and colleges affiliation and accreditation curriculum development and teacher training i now welcome on the stage director and principal of harvest international school ms dakshayani kanna with experience of over 30 plus years in his educational philosophy is to provide creative intellectual motivating yet stress free and non competitive child friendly education i welcome on stage the principal of kandor international school mr samik ghosh with over 25 years of academic and administrative experience in india and abroad with reputed schools colleges and university she has also worked as an inspector for ministry of education in the sultanate of oman i would like to welcome ms gayatri devi 
principal of little flower public school on the stage very good afternoon to all of you i think we've been having a whole lot of uh, interactive sessions i would say because it was uh, interactive more because we were thinking in our minds and speaking to the speaker on stage while they were talking so uh, when your mind starts ticking it's almost like that you're having a very silent conversation with the speaker and i think that's how we began i must tell you and i must admit i didn't know i was a chairperson of this um thing so i'm taken by surprise but uh, yes it's always wonderful to hear principal speak and uh, to set what it is to make creative classrooms i think the primary role is one of vision and i think that's very important so instead of me talking about it i'd like each of these uh, panelists sitting here to share just one way or couple of ways by which they make their classrooms or inspire the teachers to make their classrooms more creative how are they able to create spaces that can be more interactive interdisciplinary and keeping children future ready one of the prime most things that uh, i particularly believe is that um, education is one about keeping children future ready but are we aware of what's the future and if we are going to be keeping children future ready there are certain skills that we must know but are we preparing for the skills that we know and we have been trained for today for something that we don't know what's going to happen so are we able to provide them learning spaces in and around our schools such that we get the best of everything for our children the intentions are pure the purpose of my making them share their practices is that i think each one of us is a leader and each of us must have done something innovative in our classrooms and i wish that each of these uh, panelists share that because a platform such as this is about sharing our experiences uh, mrs gayatri may i request you to start innovation in classroom is the need of the hour all our schools have a timetable a curriculum and a a slot for the period it could be 30 minutes 35 minutes 40 minutes 45 minutes some of them even an hour so which makes it roughly about 7 uh, 8 or 9 periods in a day but have we ever thought of having more than 15 periods in a day we all know that the attention span of the children is very minimal very limited especially in the lower classes so what makes us have a 40 minute a 45 minute period for the kindergarten and the primary level so i think if we start thinking differently if we start understanding the need of these kids today automatically we also get into the mode of having a lot of innovation in our day to day practices in school thank you could there be one uh, experience of yours that you have uh, tried out that you can share with the audience because that would be a learning for everyone like i have already mentioned having if we can call it as periods fine or if we could give it some name and say this is rhyme time children and the rhyme time obviously cannot exceed for half an hour to 45 minutes so immediately after rhyme time you have a conversation time and a time which you could also call it as talking about oneself we are here basically trying to build communication skills in the uh, kindergarten level so 
it's very important for us to make children open up to understand the leaders inside them and to give them equal opportunities to talk even if there's a class of 15 students or 20 students how does each one get that exact time to speak to show his or her skills to show his or her talent so if we could understand on these small integrities and work more on hands-on learning experiences in the classrooms rather than just reading and writing i think there sets the ball rolling for innovation and creative teaching as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ghosh? A particular incident before that, if I allow just half a minute. You see, when I saw this topic, of course, it excited me. But I'm a bit handicapped to talk about this because my own school experience, the school where I studied, it had hardly any classroom. So what classroom do we break? We used to sit under the tree and study, and all that thing that we had by way of, a, um, by way of technology was an easel and a blackboard, which we chose not to carry for the teachers if we didn't want to be taught that day. So now that has its strengths. Also, if I give a specific uh, example, as the chairperson has requested me, I would go back to one experience which I actually learned from the students. It was my class 12 physics class. I entered the class. There was pin drop silence. They were ready with their pen, register, everything. And as I tried to introduce the thing, they said, oh, sir, don't, don't waste your time on this. Please get to the topic straight. I said, why is this complete obedience today, and w w what are you up to? He said, no, we are, I know we are starting this nuclear physics chapter and we are going to learn how to make an atom bomb. It came as a shocker for me. So what it did to me from the very next year was, when we are approaching this, to bring all the books, encyclopedia and pictorial material on World War II, leave it all over the class for them to come, browse to it. They asking questions, they talking about Second World War, then they're talking about this uh, atom bomb and E is equal to MC square, what have you, and then begin the topic. So it, it's, it's, it's something that remains with me even today and something which I request my teachers to do is to create that atmosphere of curiosity because, before you even approach the topic. Throw some things in the classroom, throw some, or take them out of the classroom, let them ask the first few questions, let them challenge you to see that if you can explain something that they can't, and then take, the, take up the topic and handhold them in that process of curiosity. So that is one example which she asked that I always. Secondly, to encourage the teacher to use the student's own experience, their own body. Like if I get up, with my left hand, I'm doing Newton's third law. I'm pushing it down and that reaction pushes me. Oftentimes we miss out on these simple things that what they are learning is part of their walking, part of everything that they do. So if that's something that we can do, I think we have broken the classroom concept of you know, keeping them seated at one place. Please remember that in many schools, children get into one classroom and stay there for the next six hours. But in many other schools, they have consciously taken the decision to move them around even at the cost of wasting those three minutes in between, it's worth it. So these would be two of my examples which I would like to share. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, and uh, on to Mrs. Seema Saini. Very interesting, the way you've mentioned about making the children future ready, and also how do we then integrate that with an interesting classroom? So future ready, I think we don't know what careers will unfold, we have to prepare them with the skills that they need, give them the competencies that are required. There could be new avenues that open up. And if the skills are there, they adapt and they learn. And they learn how to learn and they catch up with what needs to be done. So what do we do in our classroom so that they can get there? I think the most important thing we need to look at is develop critical thinking to keep the children engaged, as Mr. Ghosh said, opening up the classroom with questions. And the first thing that rolls out would be an engaged child. And if the child is engaged, 
He's a part of what's happening in the class. You're automatically getting him interested, striking his curiosity a little more, him asking questions. Both whether when they get into the question answer mode and inquiry based learning happens, we just prompt all those actions to set the ball of learning rolling. And that's the primary purpose, I think, of schools. Teach the children to learn. And to get them to learn, we have to make the uh, learning as relevant to the children as possible. Get things that are realistic in the child's world to him or her, and then the learning happens. I think that's what I would say, build in basic skills and competencies. And to make classroom interesting, if you ask me to cite an example, I would say, at the lower levels or at the elementary levels and then upwards as we go, if we just have an interdisciplinary approach in teaching, integrate all subjects uh, to a theme which is relevant to the child, whether he talked about physics, third law, so you integrate the child to the learning, to the topic that you're doing, you can bring in any subject with what you want to put across to the children. And children learn best from peers as well. So uh, I, I mean, there are a whole lot of um, takeaways that we can, we find that these are the outcomes in the process of the teaching learning in school. Yes, Mrs. Kanna, your experience. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, since morning we've been listening to a lot of educators talking about different methodologies of, uh, you know, things that are being done at preschool level and what needs to be done to make them ready for the primary school. And, uh, you know, we heard uh, one of the speakers talk about the disconnect that is there between, uh, you know, MSc and BSc and schools. Basically, what I feel is we are on the right mode. And lot of the lot of parents now and educators definitely understand how the learning has to become what it was. Previously, it used to be chalk and talk kind of a method, wherein there is a center who is the teacher, who knows all, who would ask questions. And invariably, you see the teachers asking questions before even the concept is completely taught. And the child who is there on the other side trying to answer. Now, if you ask the question, who is an expert in the subject? It's the teacher. Who has to ask the questions? It's the student, because he doesn't know. It always used to be the teacher asking questions. I have attended a humpty number of uh, workshops in India abroad, wherein there are beautiful inquiry-based methods. As Mrs. Seema said, uh, initially the topic would start off with an integrated topic. You are talking about, say, what a uh, you know, water cycle that is coming in. You are talking integrating geography into it. You are integrating physics into it. Different states of water. See, so you have humpty number of even lesson plans that are available. To make the class interesting, it is the teacher who actually needs to equip herself. Though every teacher feels that she is an expert in the subject, how it has to be taught to that customized class has to come within. The teacher has to really do a research and find out what are the different ways to put across the topic. We educators, we principals with 25 years and 30 years of experience went to IAM for a program of management where they tried us. And I had my own apprehension regarding how I'm going to learn marketing. Because I always felt that marketing is going to be one of the boring subjects which I keep aside. Because I feel that education is very sacred and marketing is not going to be a part of what I am doing. But the way I was taught, there was one Professor Murthy who is still in IMB who actually taught this topic in such a beautiful way that I really was impressed and I thought, no, I need to actually improvise my skills in talking about what I'm doing in the school to at least make parents realize what are we doing, what are our teachers. There are some speakers here who spoke about teachers being in uh, 18th and 19th century, but believe me, teachers are no more that. And schools are no more that. They are not what we are thinking. I heard one of, uh, you know, the, in the conferences, they said that people have gone and settled down in US in, say, you know, eight, uh, 1900s and, you know, 2000. They still believe that Indian schools are staying in that particular stage. There is a lot of inno innovation. In the morning, I heard the panelists talk about uh, creating interest in the classroom. Montessori classroom is a lab. I definitely endorse Montessori system, wherein the child is doing hands-on all the time. 
the teacher is just a facilitator she is not doing anything the child is learning on its own at his own pace and that's what has to come into primary schools and most of the primary schools as mrs seema said have the integrated curriculum now the divide between cbsc icse everything is gone as um, you know we discussed in the morning cbsc or ncert doesn't actually put a restriction on grade 7 or grade 9 or whatever it is they say from 8th standard you use ncert books other than that the way you teach they are not going to interfere teaching is your own to make the class interesting creative and critical thinking is absolutely necessary we need to look at that as one of the most um, you know requisites right now and apart from that you need to have the inquiry which is one of the most important things the child has to be challenged we are talking about mindsets we say that yeah stealing is wrong but we make robin hood a hero let the child have his own perspective or let him come up with whatever he is wanting to there is a conflict in the child's mind you are you are saying that stealing is wrong and you are saying that robin hood is a hero how are you going to correlate these things we need to be very careful in lesson planning as i told you a lot of work has to get in and the person or the teacher has to come up with an open mind saying that i am going to accept whatever questions that come in in my way so these are the thing that i absolutely see it is necessary when it comes to creative teaching making the classroom interesting one example as you asked me uh, we have this crunch as we rightly said you know we can't have 15 periods in a day teaching them and many of you as you have experienced bangalore traffic in the morning you know traveling time for each kid probably will be 3 hours a day that's an average when you look at it why not integrate technology we have been using it in our school beautifully well especially when the classes are missed out for some kind of you know uh, interactions and then collaborations and guest lectures we have this google as a company coming to our school and teaching our teachers how to use their applications and we can absolutely conduct the classes from home at our own time making sure that the children log in under supervision of the teachers technology has to be used effectively if you want to make the class interesting and innovative the best thing is there is no neighbor for the child to distract the child and they are definitely concentrating on what you are teaching thank you so much uh, thank you mrs kanna but uh, i'd like to ask we all believe yes technology is there to stay and uh, we also believe that uh, classrooms have to be creative and perhaps we're making our classrooms more creative going beyond walls is what i would like to define our classrooms where every open space and every space becomes a learning space uh, mrs gayatri i'd like to ask you what are the challenges that one really faces when you try and go uh, to make it a little uh, not following the beaten track if i were to use that uh, and wanting to be a little different uh i believe that children learn a lot not within the four walls of the classroom but outside the four walls of the classroom so we have a concept called as the classroom on wheels children love to go out children love to experiment children love to understand what nature is all about what do they get to feel what do they get to see what do they get to invent what do they get to experiment on but when we are taking the children out of the classroom the teacher needs to be more prepared of the place that he or she is taking them the teacher needs to be there at least a week before understand what exactly she would want the children to understand by taking them either to the planetarium or to a you know a science park or whatever the area that they're going to she prepares a beautifully uh, chalked out worksheet before the children are taken there the children are told as to what they have to expect and what they are exactly going to do when they go to that particular place and you need to allow the child to explore most of the time what happens to us is especially when we are in cities there is a time constraint and there is an infrastructural constraint as well so we given our school transport for the children to go on for these field trips but there is a time frame that is given to the teacher you need to be back within half an hour or one hour or two hours because the buses need to pick the children to go back home so these time constraints are one big hindrance that i uh, feel 
But having virtual classrooms and making the children see what they could actually experience by going out, uh, I don't think children would enjoy that so much. I have experienced this myself in my own school, where we have these uh, digital boards, children coming in and telling us that their eyes are watering, they have a headache, they have a migraine, children of this age having migraine. So technology is definitely there. We have to use technology to the optimum. But again, let's keep the, uh, it to a minimal level and not always have technology in each and every classroom. Because with technology, the teacher's role becomes very, very minimal. And I would want a teacher to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the children, see what they're exactly doing in the class, and also uh, tell, use things in the classroom itself as examples. You don't have to spend, like he mentioned, that in a physics class you can use so many of your own body movements, even in a uh, class like, uh, take a mathematics class. It's sometimes some teachers teach angles in such complicated uh, methodologies that half the children wouldn't understand. A small example, ask a children, child to open the door. Could you open the door fully? Could you open the door to a particular, just open the door halfway through. Teach them about angles using the doors, the windows in the classrooms. Teach the children the shapes and sizes using the things around in the classroom, the window grills, the uh, geometry boxes, the different boxes, the bags that they get in. How many of us really include an inch tape in our stationery while, you know, to give it to the children because that's how they exactly learn the measurements. That's how they get to know what is length into breadth. How many of us think that we can send them to the ground to measure an area? So these are innovative ways of teaching. These are ways which make, which we as leaders should make our children, teachers think out of the box. This is thinking out of the box, and this is making learning experiential and learning fun as well in classrooms. Uh, yes, very true, Gayatri. And I think uh, she did mention that uh, teachers have to be encouraged to move out. But Mr. Ghosh, my question to you is, how do you encourage teachers to move out? That's the most important question, because uh, if people are not going to be choosing uh, teaching as a profession as a first choice, how do you motivate them? Now, you see, the usual thing that uh, one comes across is the fear amongst the teachers that there's always short of time. I mean, if I do this, where do I find time to finish my syllabus? And then the next fear is, how do I finish my syllabus? How do I prepare them for the examination? Because for everything, the end goal becomes that examination, which is a problem. Also, at the same time, what happens is that if you are scared of this time constraint and scared of the, the fact that, okay, have I taught enough? Now, that's another which we have inherited from our own information-based learning. Have I taught enough? The parents comparing children with the children who come from other school and they think they have been taught enough and your children haven't been taught enough. So there are these things, but it's essentially a question of what we just saw in the previous uh, keynote speaker. It's a question of the mindset. So that is where the school, if they can give confidence to the teachers that try and don't. I heard somebody earlier to the training to training children how to fail and how to. I think you spoke about it and how to face failure. Or it was a wonderful thing. It's something that I hold very dear to my heart all through my career. That is most importantly, more than the children, perhaps the teachers should be given the confidence that do not be scared to fail. Try something out of the box. Try something crazy, and if it doesn't tell that you will not be pulled up, your increment will not be stopped, or you will not be embarrassed. So, but you must have the confidence to share that experience within the staff room. That this is what I tried, this is what worked, this is what didn't work. So that collectively we learn from your experience. If that is what we are trying very hard, I will not say that we are always successful. We do fall in for other traps too. But this is the kind of staff room atmosphere we try to maintain, and it, it works. I'll just give an example. There is a hospital which is coming up in a small district called Birbhum in West Bengal, which is entirely with, through the effort of the village, one village and the nearby other villages. They are doing, they're 
putting in their own labor, they are building the rooms, everything they are doing. What the headmaster of the school has done is something exemplary. He said, when this work goes on, at least two days a week, my children will not come to school with their teachers. They will go to the hospital and learn whatever they can learn from what's going on on the campus. And they, they get um, expert doctors who come from Kolkata twice a week. What they're doing is they're allowing school children in a responsible manner to watch even when they're doing an ECG. So, they're, I mean, you know, coming to taking education to the underprivileged or remote areas, these are the things that are coming up from the local societies. And more we encourage this, I think more we will get on the right track. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ghosh, for sharing this because I think one of the greatest uh, ways of learning is to shadow a professional and that's one thing that we have to teach our children that uh, if they wish to take up medicine, for example, as a profession, uh, can we give them that experiences in a hospital or in a lab, a pathological lab, so that they realize what kind of an occupation they are heading for. And a few days over there, perhaps we'll tell them whether they really want to be in that profession or not. So shadowing helps a lot in understanding uh, a profession. Above all, I think it gives them live experiences. And I think whatever we are talking right now is not about schooling, because there is a very clear difference between schooling and education. And I think we need to move on from uh, schooling to education. And my question to Seema would be on that. If it is about education, then we talk about creative classrooms, we talk about creative schools, then uh, there's one element and there's one group of people who need to be educated, and that's the parents. How would you go about educating parents? We need to identify who drives us, who drives the school. Are parents the ones who are driving the school? Unfortunately, that's what we see these days around us that the system demands something, parents demand something as per the system. End, role, end goal is marks, like Mr. Ghosh said, and like all of us also understand and see around us. So parents go that way, and then where does it lead our education or when we talk of what we want for our children? Schooling, of course, it's a very social environment also. Children learn a lot in the school process. What we want collectively for children as parents and their important stakeholders too. Parents and teachers and the school, collectively all three angles of this triangle, we have the child in middle. It's very important that all stakeholders get on the same platform. So school has a great onus, a great responsibility to educate the parents. How do we do that? It's very important that we align our vision and we let parents know what our vision is. It's our, ch they're our children end of the day. And the minute that comes across to the parents, there's no verses here. Parents versus school or teachers versus school. It's all for the child. And when collectively that bond, that rapport comes in, the connection between the parents and the teachers, parents and the student, uh, I mean the school, and of course then the teacher and the parent and all of that uh, goes on round in circles and you see that you are able to make an impact. It's very important that we talk one-to-one -one also, what is the language we speak. It has to be filtered. Teacher is the first phase of uh, interaction, first interface with the parent. The language that she speaks with the parent, the purpose, the reason why we are doing what we are doing has to come across very clearly. Because otherwise you will have, like we've heard since morning, you will have parents coming in and say, in so-and-so school that is being taught and my child needs to learn that. Or if we reduce writing in pre-K, in early childhood education, there would be some parents wanting to say, my child doesn't write. So in junior KG, the writing part has to begin. So this is just about elementary education, but you can have takeoffs in every section, in every class. How do we handle that part? So it's very important, whatever our purpose is, whatever our vision for the child is, that needs to be communicated to the parent. And how do we communicate is extremely important. And who are the mediums of that communication need to be taken into confidence. And when everybody's on the same platform, I don't see a gap. And my experience is it works really well if the parents know what we are doing and why we are doing. Or they would always demand the system to take over. End of the day, the child has to do a 10th, has to do a 12th. It's a board exam. We're not making children getting into PhDs right from KG or in um, 
uh, primary education. So what do we want and why do we want and what, are we go what is the outcome that we are expecting? If this is made clear to the parents, whether through PTAs, whether through our communication, through circulars, or through small meetings, our open houses when parents come in and contact teachers, or they can take appointment with the principals as well. And that makes a world of a difference, is my opinion. Uh, thanks, Seema. But uh, I would say it's a very, very ideal situation where we are able to convince parents. And I'm going to put you into a situation, uh, Mrs. Kanna, by giving you an example of a parent who says that my child has to go for an IIT class or pre-IIT class right from grade six. What do you say about that? Where, so who's going to be killing the creativity, school or parents? And how would you handle Here, it? Uh, that's a very good question. Basically, when you look at parents who are like that, on the other hand, you have parents who do not want to stretch their child and then allow thinking to them. You have both kind of parents that are there. Now, basically, parents have already formed an opinion as and when the child is growing. Initially, when the child comes um, in the more, you know, in primary, or I would say Montessori, and when you talk to the child and the parent asks the child, what do you want to become? He says, a driver, it's okay. When you come to primary, if he repeats that, then the parent will say, probably driving an airplane is a better thing to do because you will be called a pilot and you'll make a lot of money. If the child starts saying the same thing in high school, then definitely there is something to be uh, you know, worried about. Now, this parent wants the child to get into IIT. See, one thing is our school philosophy has to be very clear. Initially, in the orientation itself, we need to have a plan and we need to incorporate our values completely into Mr. our Kana, curriculum sorry development. Sorry for interrupting you because we are running short of time. But yes. I would like to come to this point of we know we have a plan. We know we have a culture in school. And uh, on the other hand, there is a definite goal and plan for the parent. Correct. There is no point of intersection. There are two parallel lines. Huh. So how do we go about it? In that case, I would definitely tell the parent that this is not a place for your child to be. I'm as clear as that. <laughs> Okay, thank you that for that, for that uh, very bold answer. But uh, just on a line of uh, conclusion, that I'd like to say that nature speaks to us and nature gives us lessons. And I think one of the greatest lessons that we can learn each time is from what happens around us. And I think that's what we have to keep our children open to. That's, again, creativity, where children learn to, le to observe, to see, observe, draw their own inferences. The recent uh, deluge in... Uh, Chennai has given us immense lessons, lessons for life that each of us as citizens and each of our children uh, should know and should be aware of. And so also was it for Mumbai, where I come from, um, when we had the bomb blast. And I remember we didn't, our parents panicked and our, uh, many of my parents asked me to counsel children because they were afraid to come to school. Because all through that six days that children sat at home, they were watching the television along with their parents. And they saw that gruesome sights and uh, were so skeptical about leaving their parents and coming to school. So I'll just share this little game that we played with our junior KG and our senior KG children. Um, we said, we have to teach them disaster management. The other children we could teach. But these children, how do we teach them? So we said that the classrooms are anyway arranged in a particular manner. Every day, every class teacher would put one toy or something out of place and put in ad an additional toy or something of great interest and very attractive thing inside the classrooms. So every day the children would come and they had to tell the teacher without touching that, that this is something new in the class. This teddy bear was here, but it's not here anymore. Where has it gone? So le the particular lessons of observation helped us a lot in helping children uh, get out of the trauma because they realized that they were pointing out every little thing that was misplaced, everything that was, mis uh, was not there that particular day. They would come back and tell, teacher, but this was there. The book has been kept there, so I will not touch the book. But at least we were very careful that uh, the children learned that something that's not theirs should not be handled. So somewhere along, uh, games help a lot in bringing our creativity. I think uh, it's important for each one of us, while we talk of an idealistic state, also take into consideration the many uh, problems that we may face. There are certain things that is in our locus 
where we can handle them. That's your pedagogy. For a creative classroom to happen, there has to be creative assessments. Only when there are creative assessments can will teachers start thinking very differently. And that will make the change in the classrooms. Thank you very much for being patient. Thank you to everyone on the stage. It was a very refreshing talk. But again, coming back to the discussion that we had at the end, talking about uh, the parents and the school, I think we all need to own the responsibility. I'm pretty sure, you know, I, I really uh, you know, applaud uh, Ms. Dakshayani's uh, uh, concept of saying, no, this is not my school if a parent demands. But on the other hand, for me, with uh, about 12, 13 years of running early childhood centers, my experience every year when we graduate senior KG children, the first and most foremost fear that is there on a parent's mind is, how will my child you know, enjoy, you know, attend the interview there? Is my child capable of doing that? Can you prepare my child for an interview? It saddens you so much when a five-year-old child has to get prepared for an interview, you know, meeting unknown people, strangers in a different school. So I think, you know, there are different school of thoughts over here. I'm glad, I think, you know, if all the schools can stand up and say no for interviews. I mean, there have, could be some way of scanning, I understand, but I think, you know, we could avoid these interviews. I think, you know, that's I where I would probably beg to differ. Uh, yeah. In Mumbai, we have online admissions, which are random sampling, so. Wonderful, wonderful. I think, you know, there should be, I mean, at least in Bangalore, it's still not there. Uh, we are still uh, facing a lot of problem in that. But anyway, I think the bottom line, everybody agreed in the panelists, and I'm pretty sure we all agree that it's not a knowledge transfer that should happen in the classroom. It has to be an engaged learning, an inquiry-based learning, and for this, the underlying thing is a teacher's empowerment and changing her attitude towards bringing new methodologies into the classroom. I think we all agreed upon that. Wonderful, I think uh, technology again was an under, a very interesting topic. Technology certainly cannot be substituted with a teacher, but she certainly can use to scaffold the child's learning to the next level, which is certainly the Vygotsky's theory, a very age-old theory. I think, you know, technology can certainly come in there. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, if there is any questions open from the audience. Can I request Mr. Mohitegri to felicitate all the panelists here? And thank you very much. It was a beautiful experience and a beautiful thoughts exchange, and everybody appreciated uh, your uh, kind of uh, thoughts about this innovative classroom teaching. And uh, the floor is open for questions. Meanwhile, Mr. Mohit Hegde will felicitate all the panelists. Can we have the bouquet and the momento? Can you please hold on, Ms. Dakshani Kanadi is coming up on the stage to felicitate you. Meanwhile, you can ask questions if you have any. Uh, can the mic be reached up to, uh, up to that person yes, there at the, the back? person there. Can the mic be given to that person out there? Mrs. Revati, would you like to take up the question? Sure, but I do hear the question. Very good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon to you. Uh, I have two. One is um, a request that I would like to put up to all these learned people. My point just is... Just a minute. Uh, I sure. just will take this. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry. Yes, please continue. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, times have been changing and we see that every five years the skills required for the job section or the employability of the, these people is changing. Yes. But our uh, CBSE syllabus, ICSE syllabus are like age old. Yes. And the problem is that we are not able to fulfill the specific needs of all these children. Like that lady said that child, a person wants to send the child for Fiji or some um, extra course in the, at the age six. The only requirement of that person is that this child should get admission in 12th. That's why all these parallel schoolings are running and they're running very nicely. My thing is, ma'am, we are adding on to a lot more syllabus. We are adding on to computers and keeping all these skills in mind, but we are not leaving whatever was there earlier. That is creating so much of stress on children, teachers, you, me, everybody. Can we? Can you suggest us some way? Thank you, Ms. Dakshani. Thank you, Ms. Seema, and thank you, Ms. Gayatri, and Ms. Jamek goes. Yeah. 
can you suggest us some ways by which we can create some kind of balance where we adopt the new but leave the old ones which is not required for us absolutely uh, the first thing that comes to my mind and thank you for the question uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, uh, an integrated program uh, most of the time you, when you're talking about what is being added you're talking in terms of syllabus i'm talking in terms of the curriculum okay so that's the basic difference that comes in and when it comes to a curriculum a lot can be integrated for example something that you do may be doing in science you're also be doing in geography now if it's done together and you are making it more application based then children start learning case studies are wonderful ways of dealing with a particular lesson very quickly okay so that's uh, again the other way of uh, handling so you have to start innovating uh, to think about newer ways of uh, dealing with a particular lesson rather than doing the lessons one after the other now where the, the, does a teacher come and tell you that i don't have time or five periods are not enough for next year onwards please grant us six periods cut down on your pe period that's the first thing that goes for a toss okay then uh, the first answer that you have to give is that there are so many lessons that can be integrated for example english history can just get integrated very easily you're doing river valley civilization make them read about it flip classroom is the best way read about it they coming back putting across a whole lot of comprehension questions discussing the whole thing wind it up with like how a moderator minds up a session that's the way the moderator the teacher facilitates the whole program and then you're merging both your english your comprehension is done and your uh, history lesson is done too and again uh, hands on experiences is uh, the other way of doing it making them uh, get on to the ground now for example you're talking in terms of uh, geography and different plantations try and do it in your classrooms i mean outside your classrooms do the plantation i'm sure the learning is far more effective I hope I've answered you. I'll discuss. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, we had another uh, speaker to should have come before uh, lunch. He's here, but I think we are crunched for time, and audience seems to be very dull. So we thought we'll break for lunch. We'll stop that, and we are moving this after lunch. All right. So please, we are going to cut short the uh, lunch. Please do come back a little early. We would be meeting uh, about five past uh, two o'clock, or ten past two, two ten, and then you know we have Mr. Mohit Hegde who would be talking about technology. Very interesting topic. Get charged and please do come back.
grown steadily in the last six years. We have expanded to about 400 schools and teach over 3.5 lakh kids of all age groups. Last academic year, 2014-15, was a significant year for Edu Sports, in which we continue to push the boundaries. We were featured on Satyameva Jayate's episode on sports, A Ball Can Change the World, and also won the best product to promote health and fitness in the world. Especially their grades at school. MyClass4.com helps schools reach parents, teachers, and students with timely communications.